Our gracious God and Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to meet together around your word. And we're thankful for the freedom we have in this country to be able to do so. There are many today that gather in secret. There are many today who are unable to gather at all. Uh, there are some that would gather, but because of ill health have been unable to. But Father, we pray to you, God, that, Lord, you'll meet the need of all of us. And we know that you're a great God and that you do meet our need. And that, Father, sometimes it's through the miraculous and sometimes, Father, it's through the, the ways that we might think you would do it. Father, Lord, every time our need, need is met, it's because uh, you're our gracious Heavenly Father. Father, I pray to God that, Lord, you'll help us to see you in the mundane and to see you in the miraculous, Lord. Help us, Father, to be moulded and shaped and conformed into the image of Christ. That, Father, we would be who you want us to be, the men and women of God you would have us to be. And, Father, Lord, while you give us breath, let us praise you with our lives, with our actions and with our words. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a blessing to be able to be here today and to share from God's word. But before I do, I want to ask this question. How many of us sleep on the same side of the bed every single night? How many of us eat very similar, eat very similar breakfast every morning? We have, a, we have a routine that we follow. We eat dinner at the same time every night. We, uh, <clears throat> we go to bed generally at the same time every day. Uh, <clears throat> today, you've come to church and you're parked in the same spot where you normally park. I would hazard to say that 90% of the people here today are sitting in the same spot that they were sitting in last Sunday. This morning's message is about change. I said those things just to share how we are creatures of habit and how change can be a challenge to us. The children of Israel were just brought out of Egypt. They were brought out of oppressive slavery and just a few weeks afterwards after being delivered from Egypt here they are coming to Moses and say we want to go back we want to stay there we, we, we want to start and continue to eat the, the, the food that, they were, that, that was uh, being provided to us by the Egyptians. The topic of change is a challenge to all of us. And we can see it quite easily in others. We can see it quite easily in the children of Israel. But the object of this morning is not to talk about the history of Israel. Great history. Wonderful lessons. But they're our lessons too. It's pointless being able to get up here and instruct people about what has happened without it having some effect in what could happen in our future. The same God who delivered the children of Israel from the oppression of Egypt is the same God that can deliver us from the oppressions that we bring upon our own lives, from the barriers that we place in our lives. And folks, most of the barriers that we place in our lives are not there because the devil placed them. They're there because we place them there. Or we allow them to be there. It's easy to grow comfortable in our own lives. We can of often <clears throat> strongly desire change in other people's lives especially the people that we love the most. Our children, our husbands and wives. We desire change in their lives and yet we're blind to the change in our own lives. Is that a fair thing to say? The need for change is often more obvious in others than it is in our own. Please don't misunderstand me. 
And this next statement may seem contradictory. I am not speaking about the change, changing in the, in the word of God, nor, uh, nor am I uh, advocating the changes in theology or the, the person of Christ or the foundational truths of God's word. There are many that have been trying to persuade believers to do so. And I believe that we should earnestly contend for the faith, as it tells us to in Jude. I believe that in the last days there will be scoffers. There will be those that will, will laugh at what we believe. And I, I often think, you know, if I got up before, before a group of my peers and, say, and, and, and said to them, you know, I believe in a literal creation. I believe that when I die, I'm actually not going to go into the soil and become worm food, that I'm going to be, uh, that, uh, uh, have a home in heaven. And that one day I believe that Jesus is going to come back and that this world will be judged. And I think, how ridiculous that must sound to the lost. But when you hear the ridiculousness of the lost... I've had discussions at, at work with people who don't believe in God, but yet they believe firmly when they die they're going to heaven. I believe that we should earnestly contend for the faith, that we should share the faith and we should not be ashamed of the faith. The change I'm speaking about is that transformational change that God speaks about throughout his word. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 it says, I, I beg you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is the reasonable stuff that God wants us to do. This is not us, this is not us walking on water. This is the reasonable stuff that God wants us to do. Be a living sacrifice. And then verse 2, and do not be conformed or pressed into the shape of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Being transformed by God, that's the change. This, the, the word transformed is the, meta, the word metamorpho, and really we get the, 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 uh, the word metamorphosis from it, where you see a caterpillar go into a cocoon and come out as a butterfly. And that's what God is trying to do to our lives. He is trying to change us into his image. Changed into the image of Christ, as it talks about in Romans chapter number 8. Change is something that is the theme of the gospel. In Ephesians 2, 1 to 8, I'm going to read this passage out, but as I read this out, can you please keep in mind what does this passage say about change? So read it with that question in your mind. And you has he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom you were also conducted your, uh, your, your, yourselves in the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and were by nature the children of wrath just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with, uh, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ, for by grace are you saved, and raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show his exceeding riches of grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, for by grace have you been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus uh, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The work of the gospel is a transformation. It's transforming us from unforgiven to forgiven, from darkness to light, from death to life, from hell to heaven, from lost to found, from being without grace to being a a possessor of grace. Change is also key to our sanctification or us being set apart for relationship with God. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any is in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are becoming new. It's a, it's a, it's a journey of change in the Christian life. God is changing us day by day and it's not like I started out early in my Christian life and I've changed and now I don't have to change anymore. It's a transformation. I don't think any of us who are in the, 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 who are in the maybe the last quarter of our Christian life would say, I've reached the pinnacle. In fact, as we grow... I often look back and say, how much more have I got to go? How much more is there left to be done in my life? I see the flesh is still there, despite the fact that I was saved over, you know, over 40 years ago, that flesh still hangs around. And sometimes I get used to the smell of that flesh. Is that what God intends us to do, is to reach a certain state and just plateau and say, no, this is it. I I, I chose the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Not because the song is so much about change, but it it is reflective of the change that God brings in a person's life. Horatio Spafford, who went through the the great loss of losing his wife and children in a in a, a tragic uh, in a tra- tragic accident where the the, the ship sank and um, he lost his entire family in one go and he went into this depth of depression and yet he came out and said it is well with my soul that's what change can do. It can make us stronger when things are harder. How many of us have gone through hard times and we want to go back to Egypt? And we want to go back to to, to what it was before. Israel had spent 400 years, not 40 years like they do in the wilderness, but 400 hundred years in Egypt and over that time they went from being welcome guests to being subjugated and slaves we see the process of change going from natural to holy from defiant or resistant to being surrendered, from fleshly to spiritual, from old to new. The process of change is a daily thing in my life, in your life. There is a challenge, isn't there? There is a challenge to change. In Romans 8, verse 15, it reminds me of what the children of Israel were trying to do. In Romans 8 and 15, it says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption whereby you can cry, Abba, Father.
Note the word after the spirit of bondage in this passage. You've not received the spirit of bondage or the spirit of slavery again. The work of the Spirit of God in our lives is not to give us what we've just had. It's to give us something brand new. But you've received the spirit of adoption whereby you have a relationship with God whereby you can call him your Abba Father. That term Abba Father is, is, is an intimate term used between a young child and their, and their parent. I remember driving down the street one day and there was a lady walking with her child and she was looking down at the child and the child's just in the pram and she's looking down and, and there was this bubble around them and she was looking down and she's, you know, like, you could just see there was like this bond, this connection and despite what was going on around them, there was this close intimacy despite the fact that, that this child may not be able to reciprocate that intimacy, the mother was just pouring out her love toward her child. You could see it. It was evident. And that's the kind of intimacy that God wants in our lives. That's the welcome intimacy that we need to have, that transformation or change will bring to our lives. When Jesus... Uh, was speaking to the, the churches in Revelation. We see the, 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 the final church, the church of Laodicea. The, the message to them was, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door and, and uh, 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 allow me in, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. It's talking about that closeness, isn't it? Sitting down and having a meal together that intimacy, and that's the sort of relationship that God wants us to have, and that's what change is about. It's about change <coughs> so that we can have that proper relationship with God. So he's not given us the spirit of bondage again. Let's, he's not given us that again. That's not what we are to go back to. That's not what we are to... That's not what the Christian life is all about. It's not about... This is the other stuff that we used to have before, except in a different way. He says, I've given you the spirit of adoption whereby you can cry to me, Abba, Father. That closeness of relationship. And I'll tell you now that, that a relationship without intimacy is not a relationship really at all. It's more a partnership. It's more an agreement. It's more just cohabitating. We need to have that closeness in our relationship with God. So that when we are in the wilderness and we can't work out through the routine of our lives how God is going to meet our need, we can still say, yeah, but God has brought us so far and he had provided for us before, and he will continue to provide for us now. The children of Israel wanted to avoid those hard choices. Even though it was exactly what God wanted. Can I just say that Egypt was God's will to start with for a season... But sometimes those seasonal things are not the way they should always be. I remember when I was young, but I'm not young anymore. <laughs> Some people might think that I'm young. When I look in the mirror, I, I, I think, who has possessed my body? What have you done with me? I can remember when I wasn't married, but I'm married now to a wonderful wife. You might say, I remember when I was well. I remember when I didn't suffer loss or grief. I remember 
the days before I went through this horrible, torturous life or circumstances that I've had to go through in the past years. There are seasons in our lives, aren't they? Ecclesiastes talks about that. What about unexpected change? I was going to write unwelcome change, but um, <coughs> I thought I'd better make it more politically correct, more palatable. Unexpected change. Sometimes change is not asked for. Sometimes it just comes. It just comes to us. Through the calamity of health, through family crisis, through employment, through financial hardship, and the list could go on. Change just is sometimes forced upon us. And the greatest challenge in any of these is that we are no longer in control. It is somehow, somehow we are being, it's being forced upon us. And during these times, we can either grow or we can grow, sorry, we can either grow to trust God or we can grow to not trust God. And not trusting God, what does that lead to? What does that... What does not, not responding to change in the right way do? We've seen it breed resentment and fear and bitterness and hurt and anger and unrequited pain. But if we are prepared somehow, perhaps pre-prepared, that will help us to meet that challenge. You know, there are some things that, you know, uh, we're scared to pray about, you know. And can I just say that God knows our thoughts. He knows the very intents of our hearts. But sometimes when we come to pray and we think, oh... I don't want to pray about this. You know, I don't want to surrender this to God. I don't want to... And we wrestle with God like Jacob. And we wrestle with God and we, and we wrestle because we don't want to surrender. And that's not what God wants for our lives. But if we pre-prepare ourselves and keep this sort of mindset in our place where you know it, it, where it talks about in Romans 8 28 and 29 that all things work together for good to them who love God to those who are called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow them he did also predestinate to be what to be conformed into his image Lord whatever you have in the Lord's Prayer. How does, how does Jesus finalise the Lord's Prayer? He says, not my will. No, but yours be done. How did Jesus finalise his life? Not my will, but yours be done. Not all things are good, but if we pre-prepare our minds and our hearts by keeping this in mind that we have a good God, we have a great God who will get us through those hard times. We have not been, find me a place in God's word where it says Christians are quarantined from hardship. I can actually show you, you read... First and Second Peter, where Peter's, Peter's writing to the persecuted church, and he doesn't say, "Oh, this is amazing that you're going through this." I, I am so ashamed of God and what He's allowing in your life right now. That's not what he says. He says, he says "All these trials that you're facing, they're more precious than gold. They'll be tried by fire. It's going to purify you." 
So there is nowhere in God's word where we're told, hey, put your hand up for Christianity because it is a fun ride. We need to prepare ourselves for the reality of the relationship that we have with God. That God is not just a supermarket that we walk down the aisle and think, I'll take some of that. I'll leave that one. Oh, this one's on special today. I'll take that. When I look back over my life, our lives... I see pivotal moments where I was battling, where we were battling to surrender to God. And I see those times of the greatest change in our lives. The hardest times of our lives. And I don't look back in the far history. Some of them are in my far history. But some my wife and I are going through right now. But I know that God is good. I know that he can do things well beyond my ability to do so. So why do I have to be in control? Why can I not just stop being so fearful about being in control and let him have control so that he can change me that he can change us and make us into what he wants us to be. Why are we fighting against God? Why are we resistant against God when we have such a great God? And the reason that is, is because we are not reminding ourselves of the goodness of God. God is just an adjunct to our life. And that's not who God is. God is the one who spoke life into existence. I need to let God have control in those times. And when God has broken through my fear and my pride to have prime place in my life, then as it speaks about in Romans chapter 6, where I yield to him as being the master of everything and I am not the master. I give up arguing and wanting to know why he would allow something to happen and allow his sovereignty to be the answer to that question, that God is a sovereign God. Changing right and adapting and accepting change can be hard. We look through God's word and we find many examples where bad choices were made during pivotal times. From Adam to Abraham to David. I'm not picking kings like Ahab and uh, other kings that did that which was right in their own sight. I'm picking, I'm picking people who God used, who are the heroes of our faith, who are the patriarchs in history. We need to change right. When change is needed, we need to change right. To use the opposite of this morning's reading, just a few chapters on, <clears throat> we read when Moses went up to Sinai to receive the law. He was gone for a little while. And what happened while Moses was up receiving the law? The children of Israel were down worrying what's happening. And what did they do? They persuaded Aaron to make for them a golden calf. We need something. We need some, they were very insecure. They needed something. They were fearful. They were living in fear. And what did they do? They, they ended up going to this sort of paganized freedom. 
They went from wanting to go back to slavery to a paganized freedom. And that's not what God wants for our lives, is it? And yet that's exactly what we sometimes adapt to in our lives. We have this paganized Christianity. We think in order to reach the world, we need to be like the world. to skip to my next point because I've been speaking too much and I can tell that because my voice is running out and my wife gave me a cup of water and I said to her <coughs> I don't need a cup of water, honey, I'm fine but what is the purpose of change? the purpose of change is for transformation not outward compliance but inward transformation God is interested in the heart, not at, not the outside, but the inside. Is not the purpose of change to have a closer relationship with God and knowing him and allowing him to be enough for us. Paul wrote in Philippians and shared this message of transformation. In, in Philippians chapter number 3 and verse 7 it says, but what things were gained to me, I count them but loss. Yet indeed, I also count f things for loss, uh, uh, all things for loss, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, for my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. This whole chapter is about transformation. It's about allowing God to have his will and way in our lives. The whole book of Colossians, in fact, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians is about transformation, transformative change. They were coming from, they, they were coming from Judaism, from paganism, from legalism and then <coughs> and into this new faith. And it's about knowing the God of your salvation. I'm not sure as to why God has given me this message today. Perhaps it's just for me. In which case, I want to thank you for indulging me. But perhaps I'm not the only one confronted with the challenge that change brings. Perhaps I'm not the only one that needs to build up some spiritual resilience in my life. And when confronted with the challenge of change, <coughs> I'll be ready to respond to it in the right way, in a surrendered way, in a way to say, God, you're in control, I don't have to be. I don't have to be in control. And I'll tell you, as you read through the Gospels, Jesus never talks about you being in control of your life. He says, come unto me, all you that labour and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything that you're worried about, I'll take care of. Is that not the God, the, the saviour of of transformation in our lives. Can I ask that you'll take some time today to meditate and pray and ask God, are you challenging me around change? Am I being stubborn, God? And if I am, please make that clear to me. 
I'm not asking you to pray that for someone else. Because a, a person persuaded against their will is of the same opinion still. I'm asking us as individuals to pray for us as individuals that God will make us soft to change and surrendered to his will. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, I pray to God that, Lord, you'll just work in our lives, work in my life, Father, to see that you're in control and that I don't have to be. And when change comes, that, Father, it won't be... <clears throat> I won't be resistant to it. That, Father, I will see that you're wanting to transform my life. Make me more the man of God that you want me to be. More your son. More your child. In relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray this now. Amen.